Let's generalize our tensor description. And we're going to do so by essentially adding and removing both covariant and contravariant ranks to and from the tensors that we already have a good understanding of. Right? For example, if we take a primal vector, which has a contravariant rank 1, we can add a covariant rank. So if we add a covariant rank, then we end up with a linear map. If we take our dual vector and we add a contravariant rank, we end up with a linear map as well. Now we could use a different type of manipula a manipulation to end up with a bilinear form or bilinear map or essentially anything that we can think of, tensor-wise at least. And so this is the method we're going to use to explain or to generalize tensors in this module. We're going to discuss how to build them up as well as decompose them into, into lower rank tensors. So we asked the question, can we generalize the tensor definitions presented throughout this PowerPoint from vectors and covectors to linear maps and the rank three bilinear map uh, type tensor that we looked at in the previous uh, module. Now, the answer to this question, can we generalize them, is yes, but it would be difficult to do so. And what I mean by that is I have seen tons of expressions where, you know, they define a tensor and then they have some, you know, generic number of indices and, you know, they do the same thing for the superscripts. Um, now, and that's the reason why this course is named for non-mathematicians is because I'm trying to stay away from things like that. I personally don't react well to those types of presentations, so we're not going to do that. So for a tensor with some undetermined number of covariant and contravariant ranks, right, it's going to be difficult to present this description in a easily comprehensible way. So what if we discuss how to increase or decrease the covariant or contravariant rank of any tensor, as well as the effect of that change on its behavior. This again is very similar to the example I presented in the previous presentation, um, previous module where, you know, we build a three-story building and if someone wants to know how to build a 10-story building, well, we teach them how to go from three to four, four to five, and then you simply just extend that process. So we feel that this solution, meaning you know we're gonna increase and decrease the covariant and contravariant ranks, may be easier to present as well as understand. Uh, I do think it can perhaps lead to a more um, in-depth, a more natural understanding of the tensor generalization. So it is valid because we can build any tensor by simply adding or removing the necessary number of contravariant and covariant ranks, right? That's the only thing that separates the primal vector from the dual vector, from the linear map, is this characterization in terms of number of contravariant and number of covariant ranks. So we're gonna look at four different cases, actually five, because we do have the base case. Um, five different cases when we talk about the input-output relationship of a tensor, um, how we generate the tensor from its coordinate matrix and basis, um, the, 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 the composition of the basis. So essentially all these different characteristics. And so the first case is going to be the bilinear map, uh, the rank, three object that we looked at uh, as part of the last module. So this is going to be our starting point. And then from there, we are going to, and this is, would be case number two, add one contravariant rank to that rank three tensor, increasing its contravariant rank from one to two. Okay. The covariant rank would remain at two unchanged. So that's case number two. Case number three, we add one covariant rank, but the contravariant rank stays the same. So we add one covariant rank to the rank three tensor. Obviously that takes it up to rank four, uh, increasing its covariant rank from two to three. So right here, you would end up with a contravariant rank one and a covariant rank three. Whereas up here, you would end up with a contravariant rank two and a covariant rank Two. So if you think about it, right, this initial tensor that we're starting out with has a contravariant rank one 
and a covariant rank two. So that's our starting point. I apologize for um, you know how messy my handwriting is, but right, we're starting with the bilinear map, which has a contravariant rank one, covariant rank two. So when we add one contravariant rank, that goes from one to two. When we add one covariant rank, this goes from two to three. And the other value stays the same. All right, so fourth case, we remove one contravariant rank, okay, from the rank three tensor, uh, decreasing its contravariant rank from one to zero. And so that essentially is going to leave us with the bilinear form. The uh, contravariant rank zero and the covariant rank two. So, okay, I say it below. This is equivalent to converting the tensor to a bilinear form. And then the fifth case, the last case, is to remove one covariant rank from the rank three tensor, decreasing its rank from two to one. So let's draw a picture of what that looks like really quickly. We started off with our, what we call the bilinear map or the general uh, rank three object. So how did that look? It had one contravariant rank all right so we have one set of rows and it has two contra two covariant ranks okay so what that means is we not only we have two ways or two indices required to define the column right there is the outer column which in this case would be are you in the first or the second group of columns. And then the second covariant index would be which element you are within the sub element. So this is our base case. This is um, a contravariant rank one, covariant rank two. All right. And so we need room for five different cases. I'm actually um, let's start off with the ones that remove a rank because they'll probably require less space. So let's talk about what happens. I'm trying to figure out how to lay this out. All right, so what happens when we remove or decrease the uh, covariant rank? Okay, so when we do that, what's going to happen is we no longer are going to have a second covariant index, which means that all of these sub elements will be collapsed to a single element. And so what we'll be left with is something, and again, the size is a little bit inconsistent here, but we would essentially end up with a linear map. Okay. So I believe this was the fifth case. This is obviously the first case, the base case. All right. Now, what happens when we remove a contra variant rank. So what's going to happen is we're no longer going to have different rows. So essentially, all of this is going to get pushed up into a single row. Now, that doesn't change the fact that we have these sub elements, they're going to remain. So we have something that looks like this. All right, this would be a bilinear form. All right, up here, right, this is uh, covariant, contravariant rank one, covariant rank one. This is contravariant rank zero, covariant rank two. All right, now let's talk about adding ranks. Now here is where things will be a little bit more difficult to visualize. So let's go with the easier one, which is going to be adding a contravariant rank. Okay, so now we need two different indices to indicate the row. And the way that we can represent that is we can essentially expand these sub elements and give them multiple rows, which will make them look like little embedded matrices. So what we end up with is something that looks like this. So 
Sorry, I'm trying to make this close to the same size as the original. Hopefully you get the idea. Um, right, we have now this, um, this new tensor, which will have a contravariant rank two and a covariant rank two. And that makes sense because now let's say to identify this element right here. Okay. We need four numbers, right? First, we need to identify its first contravariant rank, which would be three. Then we need to identify its first covariant rank, which would be two. Then we need it. We need to tell, um, we need to identify what row it is within this sub element. So that would be contravariant um, index uh, one, okay, position one. And then what's its column within the sub element? So that would be covariant index one. All right, so we need four different numbers to identify the location of a given element. And that makes sense since it's rank four or contravariant rank two, covariant rank two. Uh, so this, if that's case number five, this is case number four. I don't know, let's see. So add one contravariant rank. So this is actually case number two right here. And then finally, we have um, adding a covariant rank. I don't have a lot of space, but let's see if I can squeeze it in here. So essentially, right, um, and I may need to erase something. Let's see, I don't think I'm gonna have enough room here. Um, Unfortunately, I think I need to erase this. Sorry, one second here. All right, so now let's um, look at the first case, which is adding one covariant rank. So I need a little bit of space here. What I'm going to do is, again, wherever there's an X, I'm going to replace that with a subarray with multiple elements. Why is it row oriented? Because we're adding a covariant rank. Okay, so originally we had something that looked like this. Okay, originally there was three X's here. Now I'm gonna replace each individual X. And this is gonna get big pretty quickly. I don't know if I'm gonna have room to write all of this. Um, but you can see here that we end up with a tensor for which if we want to define a single element's location, and I'm not gonna have enough room to draw all this, we would need a second column with the same values. Um, in order to identify a single location, let's say this right here, we need five numbers, okay? Oh, sorry, uh, four numbers, right? We need its row, we need its first covariant uh, index. So is it on the uh, in the first column or the second column? Then we need its second covariant index would be, is it A, is it B, is it C, you know, within that first column. And then the third covariant index, which would be essentially, is it the first element or the second element right there? Okay, and so this would be what happens when we add one covariant uh, rank. So, I mean, that is a preview of what we're going to talk about in this video. We want to look at how we take this basic rank three tensor and we expand it or contract it. And then hopefully that'll build an understanding of the generalization of it. So let's look at uh, the tensor based input output mapping. So we consider tensors that map more than one input vectors to a single output vector. And now that I look at this, and if I were to rewrite this slide, I would actually say a better way of saying this is that these tensors in general, okay, they map some generic tensor product of primal vectors to some other, uh, not enough room. 
some other um, tensor product of vectors. Okay, we can have multiple vectors in the input, we can have multiple vectors at the output, and we can think of them as separate primal vectors, or you know, we can think about it as uh, them being combined via tensor product. Um, so, oh, actually I wrote that down here, nice. So it's more accurate to say that it maps one vector-based tensor product to another. Okay, so here you have that down below. So when we say the number of inputs, really what we're talking about is the number of input primal vectors fed to this tensor product. And when we talk about the output, um, we're really discussing the number of, um, the, well, the output, how many uh, primal vectors it can be decomposed into. All right, so let's start off with this expression right here. This is the original from the last section, our bilinear map. And this is an expression we've seen before. This defines some tensor. Now note that this T is generic in this section. So when we say tensor T, um, there's no assumption about its size or composition because as you can see in the next slide, we use it over and over again. So they're, they're defined differently each time. Okay, so this is what we started off with. A tensor which accepts the primal, the tensor product of two input primal vectors and generates a single output primal vector. The output, we can define the size as shown here, right? It has a single superscript because it is a primal vector. It only has um, rows. And so this can be imagined or visualized as a column oriented array, even though it's not an array, with n out one elements. All right, and now let's look at how that expression changes if we were to increase the covariant rank. When we increase the covariant rank, essentially what we're doing is we are adding another input. And that makes sense because if we look at our our visualization over here, the first input, VA, would be multiplied by the first covariant rank, VB by the second covariant rank, and VC by the third. So we have three embedded layers of elements in this tensor, and that corresponds to three primal vectors that will be um, accepted as inputs. It still generates a single primal vector, and the size of the output remains the same. So the size of this tensor will be different from here to here, but the size of the output will remain the same. And what I've tried to do is um, highlight, um, using some you know, various colors, highlight um, what changes are present. So this is case number one, this is case number two. Now let's look at what happens in the rest of the cases. Okay, so we've already gone over one, we've already gone over two. This was the original. This is what happens when we increase the covariant rank. Now, what about the contravariant rank? When we increase the contravariant rank, we'll see that this piece here remains the same. We're gonna see a relationship between changing covariant rank and the number of inputs, and contravariant rank and the number of outputs, or how many primal vectors are combined via tensor product. So you see over here, when we increase contravariant rank, this remains the same, but now we add a second V out two, okay, which is combined with V out one via tensor product, and the size of the output changes. It's given now a first contravariant uh, length as well as a second contravariant length because the output generated here will look something like this. It will look like a column array, even though again, it's not an array, with embedded column arrays as its sub-elements. Okay, now what if we decrease the oh, sorry, covariant rank? Well, that leads us to a linear map. So we saw already that when we change the covariant rank, we can add an additional input or it can get rid, it can delete an input. So when we go from here down to here, what we're actually doing is just getting rid of VB, and what we end up with is a familiar linear map-like expression. Tensor T, right here, maps a single primal vector to a single, uh, well, it, it maps one 
input primal vector to another primal vector, output primal vector. The size remains the same. Again, when we play around with the covariant rank here and here, it doesn't change the, the, the size and the structure of the output. Then finally, we decrease the contravariant rank, and that gives us a bilinear form. So when we play around, if we look back at our base case, right, what we see is that when we play around with the contravariant rank, we're essentially removing one of the elements that's supplied to the tensor product. But here, we only have one element. So when we remove that, we're left with simply a scalar value. The input remains the same as it was up here because we didn't play around with the with the covariant rank and the output is simply just a scalar number. So this is the type of analysis that we're going to do in this section. I'm going to pause here because I don't want this video to get too long and I do want people to, let's say, consume them in digestible chunks. So right, this one, two, three, four, five, these five cases, we're going to use these throughout this two, three modules. I don't know how long it's going to take in order to explain to you what is the difference between a tensor and those which neighbor it in terms of one covariant or contravariant rank higher or one covariant and contravariant rank lower. And again, hopefully we can extrapolate that to some generic number of um, some, some generic uh, rank, which means the sky's the limit in terms of how complex and large you can build it. And in the next module, what we're going to do is, um, is look at other characteristics. So here we just barely started. We're looking at the tensor-based input-output mapping. However, we still need to look at its structure, although we've kind of already done that so far. Um, but we'll look at its structure, we'll look at its coordinate matrix, its basis, and we'll use this methodology in order to further explain the difference between our basis rank three tensor and the different variations that we uh, analyze.